Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, beautiful day, um, the end of April, where you're faking us out and making us think it's summer already. Um, we, we appreciate that a lot, and we praise you for the hot sun, um, both genuinely and sarcastically. Um, thank you, but really, Lord, I really am very appreciative of your creation and, and being able to be part of it and be part of your story. And we are excited to be here to worship you, um, and I ask that as we learn and as we wrestle with things, uh, that you would give us uh, insight into our own character, insight into your character, give us hope, um, especially where we're feeling like we can't hold it together, give us a sense of mission in the places where we feel lost, um, and in the places where we just think, man, I don't even know if I can make it to tomorrow I just ask that you would give us shoulders to lean on um, in our community. Holy Spirit, as I always pray, come on us and give us courage uh, to believe what's true and to push aside what is false today. I ask that in your name. Amen. Well, I just, I guess, want to make a few announcements about Easter. So I said that I would have a video together um, to show you some of the baptisms because they all happened Sunday evening. Um, but the video program that I've been using is really, it got updated and it doesn't work and I am used to using this video program. So I've had to switch over to Premiere and I got a flu. Um, and so if you know how to use Premiere at all, I would really like some help because I, start, I opened it up and I looked at it and I shut it down because it was terrifying. Um, so, uh, if, or if you got any video of the baptisms, because our video didn't turn out as well as I had hoped, I would love to have some of that. But for those of you who weren't here this e- not last evening, it was packed in here. Um, it, was, it was crazy. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we even had an extra person, Vicky, got baptized. For those of you who don't know Vicky, she got baptized. And that was really cool, like right there on the spot, because she'd been wanting to get baptized for a year, and she missed the last time, and it just, it's a boom. It turned out that Kevin had extra clothes in the back of his car that he, you know, and he came to the rescue. So Vicky got into Kevin's clothes and got baptized. It was a, it was a pretty cool thing. Uh, but anyway, so that was, Easter was really, really exciting, and it was a lot of fun to be part of. Um, but today, we are in a series we're starting a new series called Prophet, Priest, and King. And so I'm going to be talking about prophet. And, and I guess what I'd like to open up with is to say that a prophet, whatever you think a prophet is, you have my clicker, right? Okay, good. Whatever you think a prophet is, um, what they tend to do is that they tend to address, uh, thanks for the text, by the way, Christina. <laughs> Christina. <laughs> I'm like, Christina's texting me. Wait a minute, Christina's right there. Uh, Awesome. Anyway. (laughs) Yeah. um, Prophet. So we're going to talk about what prophets address. (laughs) And my brain brain has just gone blank. Okay. No, that's not your fault. Um, Anyway, well, we'll we'll just, we'll just, we'll skip over. Anyway, prophets. Flip the, flip the slide. We'll go this way. We're, we're good. Go ahead and flip the slide, Rod. Okay. Jesus as a prophet. We're going to talk about Jesus as a prophet. Now, I want to say that for those of you who've been in following Jesus for a long time and who know things about the Reformation, you understand that in 30 minutes, I cannot cover Jesus as a prophet. I could spend an entire year and maybe not do a good job of that. Nor could I really explain the, the idea of Jesus being a priest and a king in a way that would satisfy everyone. So I have 30 minutes to talk about Jesus as a prophet. And when you think about prophets, usually what you think about as a prophet, you think about fortune tellers, right? I mean, that's kind of the prophet that you think about. Uh, they, they are going to tell you what the future is. They're going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. But prophets, when it comes to the Old Testament, so you have New Testament and Old Testament in the Bible. New Testament, really tiny. Old Testament, really big. And the Old Testament is the story between God and Israel. And prophets happen to be part of that story. And prophets are in particular interesting, and you can flip the slide, because they have had a divine encounter. So, 
because I kind of got jumbled around. You're just going to have to follow me a little bit here. So when we talk about prophet, priest, and king, what we're talking about is this idea that they're like offices, okay? So there's the office of the priest, and there's the office of the of the prophet and the office of the king. Um, but that does not, when we talk about these offices, we're not talking about the office, right? So we're not talking about Michael Scott. We're not talking about staplers and jello. We're not talking about beet farming or Drude or, or anybody else you can think of in that show, right? We're not thinking about that. Um, and we're not thinking about cool office chairs, which, by the way, my, uh, my mom somehow managed to get me a $1,000 office chair for like, 50 bucks. I don't know how she pulled this off. But that chair in my bedroom, it's like sitting in like, you know, like it's like a throne. I love it. It feels really good. I I tell you, a thousand dollar office chair feels comfy. Um, Anyway, so it's not talking about any of that. It's more like the office of the president, right? Right now, Trump fills the office of the president. A while ago, we had Obama. We had lots of Bushes and, and Clintons and Reagan and all that, right? We have, they fill an office, right? So they fill a position of power or authority, something that's set aside, right? So when we talk about these three offices, prophet, priest, and king that Jesus fulfills, we're talking about these offices in the Old Testament. Now, before we get into those three, we need to understand that Jesus really only holds one office that's super important to you and I and really deals with... Um, kind of the reason that he came to earth. So we'll start with that. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Joseph ends up finding out that his wife Mary is pregnant, and it's not his kid, and well, it's not his wife yet either. And so he's not going to put her away because it turns out that this might be a cosmic child. And so to kind of help him along the way, he gets a visitation from an angel, and the angel tells him this in verse 21. It says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So the one office that Jesus holds sets in his name, and that is that he's going to save people from their sins. Jesus means the Lord will save. Like, so, we, so his office is Savior. Right? That's the thing that Jesus does. Now, if we go back to those other offices... In the Old Testament, you have to get anointed for those offices. A prophet, in order for him to do whatever he does, he has to have an encounter with God. There has to be some kind of both visible anointing and encounter with God. So remember we covered Isaiah 61, and you know he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. There's this sort of what we would call an anointing. Well, here's a good old, you know, there are dad jokes. Well, here's a pastor joke. You see... In the New Testament, the New Testament writers, they always say Jesus Christ, and Christ is not Jesus' last name, okay. right? Christ, <laughs> it's not, guys, come on, it's a dad joke. Anyway, thank you. Um, Christ, N.T. Wright translates Christ as king, right? It means anointed one, it means Messiah, but a good way to think about it is king, and a king is someone who has to be anointed. A king is someone who has to be set aside, right? So, these offices have some kind of divine thing. Christ has had this, is and has this divine anointing. You can flip the slide. So here are the offices. Flip the slide again. I will tell you, I'll just pause, that when I've been sick all week, you're just going to get an interesting sermon. Okay. <laughs> but, okay, so what, is, what, is God have, what does Jesus have to save us from? What is this office all about? Right? Well, Jesus has to save us from a very, very important thing. Sin, right? That's, that's what you hear every preacher tell you. Sin is the thing that Jesus is saving us from. But here, I want to talk about sin and this idea of worship for a minute because they're important in us understanding how Jesus acts as a prophet and how you and I are called to act as prophets. So first I want to talk about worship because worship is the way that you and I are designed to be. Okay, what we're to do. So, but, but we don't use this word very often. I don't go around and say, let's, let's worship something other than here, where we say worship God. Or we accuse people maybe of false worship, but even that is not a, a common thing. So here's a good way of understanding worship. Worship is adoration, right? To adore someone. And literally to adore someone means to, like, your mouth to their mouth, 
right? It's an intimacy. It's like kissing. To adore someone is to kiss and to be kissed. So there's this intimacy. So the what you and I were created for is an intimacy with God. In fact, in the beginning of Genesis, there's this phrase where it says that Adam walked with God in the cool of the night, which, by the way, is the only time in the desert you want to walk with God, right? Because it's in the cool of the night. That's the best time. But that, what that's saying is, is that there's this deep intimacy with God. That, so when we step into worshiping God, we're stepping into an adoration of God. What we're stepping into is intimacy with God. That's what we're created for, is to have intimacy with God. But sin, you know, we, the word in the Greek means, just, it's just an archery term, right? It's missing the mark. You didn't hit the target. But a better way of understanding sin, if you look at it all the way through the Old and New Testament, is a splintering of intimacy, Okay, a complete splintering. So if worship is wholeness, you could say, then sin is splintering. Right? So everything about you has been splintered out, and now there is no way for there to be any kind of intimacy. So think about it this way. When you wrestle with your own sin and you conquer a sin, you're like, oh, yeah, I conquered the sin. I no longer do this. Oh, you got ten other splinters to deal with right? And think about, when you think about just darkness itself, evil, and then you start working with the word Satan and Diablo, you know what these these words actually at their root mean splintered. Any time in the New Testament, think about when Jesus deals with a demon or or the the people, the apostles deal with a demon. It's never an I demon. It's never a single demon. It's always us. What do you want to do with us? Why are you here? Because as soon as darkness enters in, wholeness disappears and splintering happens and intimacy disappears, okay? So the reason that you and I need a Savior, the reason that that is the very most important office of of Jesus when he comes to earth to walk and to die and to raise from the dead is that you and I need to be brought back into wholeness, right? You and I need to be brought back into wholeness. Now, these three offices of priest, our prophet, priest, and king are ways that Jesus acts perfectly in an Old Testament sense, but he walks out, walks on the earth to bring about that wholeness. He talks about himself this way as a priest and as a prophet and as a king. And he is, these are the ways he acts out being a savior. This is how he's going to engage sin and draw us into worship. So you can flip the slide, Russ. Um, so what does an Old Testament prophet do? You like my little video game icon there? Yeah, awesome. Like, he even looks like his staff is sort of coming out. Anyway, what does an Old Testament prophet do? An Old Testament prophet, first thing that they do, once they've had an encounter with God, is that they reveal the heart of God. Okay? So they reveal to the people what God is, is in God's heart, how he feels about things. So think about it. We have 15 prophets who have recorded, you know, when you think about Jeremiah, Isaiah, Obadiah, you know, all those fun people, there are 15 books of them. Uh, We just finished up Daniel, one of them. But if you go through them, what do you hear? Part of them is just God pouring out his heart for his people. This is how I feel. I long to gather them up. I long for this. This is what a prophet does. It speaks what God's heart is. So he reveals God's heart. The second is that he speaks with authority. Right? He speaks God's words authoritatively. This is, thus saith the Lord, right? That's what a prophet does. God says this. He's had an encounter with God. Here's what God has to say. So he reveals God's heart. He speaks God's word, and he reframes God's truth, right? Contextualizes it. It's continually bringing it down to the place where people are at. So he reveals, he speaks, and he refrains. He refrains. He doesn't refrain. Flip that slide. So how does he go about doing this? Well, the first thing you'll notice in the Old Testament is that prophets tend to be very accusatory. Right? Prophets point the finger. And what do prophets say? You have sinned. You have left. You've done this. And what are the three things they tend to get at? Number one, idolatry. Your worship has moved somewhere else. Right? And that's what idolatry is. You've begun to splinter alliances. So with Israel, it's like you've gone to Egypt. You've gone to Babylon. You've gone to 
the Assyrians. You, you've asked for help from somebody else besides me. So you have idolatry, you have the alliances you've made, and then the last one that prophets tend to really get upset about, and because God's upset about it, is the way that we treat the poor. This is all over the, the prophets, repeatedly, right? as the way that we treat the poor. So it's our idolatry, our alliances, and the way the poor and orphan is treated. So that's usually the accusation. Then there is, in a prophet, this call to repent. Let's turn around, right? You need to repent. Now, you've, if you've read any of the Old Testament, you know that repenting doesn't happen. You know if you've lived out your life for any year, amount of years, repenting doesn't happen. Right? Repenting is a hard kind of thing to do, especially when you've got really nice, strong alliances, and you like your idolatry, and the poor cause too many problems for you. Right? Like that, that's very difficult to repent. And so what happens is that prophets begin to talk about this thing called the day of the Lord. Right? And the day of the Lord will come. And it's usually a judgment. And here's the thing, it often sounds really cosmic, but prophets are trying to get people's attention. So for instance, Jeremiah, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and going into exile as the end of the world, like creation is being turned up and destroyed. You know, not really. You know, Jerusalem is being destroyed and you're going to, into exile. But prophets are trying to get people's attention. Now, those, those, their prophetic sayings sometimes have stuff to do in the future, but a lot of times they're talking about the present and they're using lots of imagery that seems very drastic to explain what God is going to do and how God feels about things. Now, here's the other thing about prophets. Nobody listens to them, right? As one famous person said, people stone their prophets and take care of their priests, right? Because prophets are always accusing and and calling people to repentance and talking about the day of the Lord. So, this is the reason for that is, is that prophets do crazy things. For instance, like Isaiah preached naked to get people's attention. Ezekiel cooked his food over cow dung and built an entire model of Jerusalem and smashed it. Right? And here's the thing. Nobody listened to them. So other prophets later on collected their stuff and put it together because they said, oh, look, it all came true. We need to collect it and listen to what's being said. But in their, in their time, nobody was like, oh, like we need to carefully look at what Isaiah is saying. They're not, they're not caring what's being said. People don't tend to listen to their prophets because they're a little crazy. Let me flip the slide. So, what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, you heard read in the text earlier out of Deuteronomy, this guy named Moses. I'm pretty sure this is not how Moses looked. Um, but he was taking a selfie, and I think is what's there, with his tablets. He's like, before we head on down the mountain, everybody. <laughs> I mean, he should have had a little veil over his face probably because of the glow. But anyway, <laughs> this is before he found out the Israelites had built a golden calf, um, even as a smile. Anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 18 was read to you, but I want to, I want to read it to you again. It says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when he, you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see the great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. So this is a cool thing because Moses is the great prophet and he's the first and he's saying, there is one coming who's greater than me. Well, Peter, so we have this narrative in the New Testament. This is how it works. The narrative is Jesus came and there are four nice, wonderful books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us all about his life. But in that story, he dies, raises from the dead, ascends into heaven, and sends his spirit in Acts 2. We, we hear the spirit of God comes up onto the church and is sent out into the world. And Peter, the scared little Peter that we heard about on Easter in the morning, that Peter, the one that God restored, stands up and in a sermon, he says, hey guys, you know, and Matt, you can check this out in Acts chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, like, 
that guy prompt that, that Moses was talking about, that you read about and learned about all your life, and you killed? Uh, he raised from the dead, and he just happened to be the great prophet that Moses was talking about. That was him. Because Jesus was the perfect prophet who spoke only God's words. Okay, so Peter says, Jesus is the great prophet. You can flip the slide. But Jesus had a few things to say about himself when it comes to being a prophet. In Luke chapter 13, um, verse 33, before this, the uh, Pharisees are saying, hey, you better watch out, Jesus. People are coming for you, uh, you know, the, the, the Romans and all that. And he says, nevertheless, I must journey in this. Oh, this is total Jesus. I can see him walking along. Well, nevertheless, I must journey tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and the next day. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Like, and they're like, huh? Right. He had, he had a point. He says, I'm a prophet, and you know, I gotta, this is how it is. So then, after a time when he was teaching in Matthew 13, 57, it says, And they took offense to him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and his own household. So Peter says he's the great prophet. Jesus understood at least what his actions on earth were doing were prophetic, and he was a prophet. So, you can flip the slide. So here's the thing that you and I need to deal with. This guy named Scott McKnight. We don't have to deal with him, but for those of you who like to read, um, you should read Scott McKnight. He's a really awesome Anglican theologian who I've loved for a very long time. Um, Other than he actually thinks he's cool, uh, he's really cool. Um, And this is what he says. It says, if Jesus was prophetic, then the church that follows him is prophetic. If Jesus was a prophet, then the followers of Jesus are to embody a prophetic message in how they live. So here's why you go through this idea of Jesus being a prophet and why he's the perfect prophet and why we would even talk about it. It's because as his followers, that puts us in the prophetic office. That means that the church itself has a prophetic voice to the world, meaning it has to reveal the heart of God. It has, it has to speak with authority, and it needs to reframe truth into the context of the people around it. But it also means you individually hold the office of prophet as a follower of Jesus. And as holding that office, that means to the people around you, in your community, the village, and outside, but in your community, you have a prophetic voice. That means that you are to reveal the truth, to those, you know, to reveal the heart of God to people around you, to speak with authority to one another, and to reframe the truth, okay? This is your calling, to follow Jesus. Now, you can flip the slide. I want to go back to the sin splintering wholeness worship because the prophet does not live here. The prophet lives over here in this loop, okay? The prophet lives in the sin-splintering area. That's what the prophet addresses. The priest and the king come in different parts of this loop. But where the prophet comes, where the prophet speaks, is to sin. The prophet speaks to sin, and the prophet tends to speak to a couple places. The prophet, one, comes and speaks to the place of judgment in people, right? So one of the things that you and I wrestle with is our judgment of one another. We are constantly making assessments. We are assessing how you are judging me and how I am judging you, and we are acting on those judgments. The prophet addresses those because that is a splintering part of our lives and of our world. The the second thing that the prophet addresses is a moralism that we live in. See, all of us have an idea about what is right and wrong. All of us. I love watching debates with with atheists and, and, you know, and and so I like watching Sam Harris and all those kind of guys. And I love listening to them talk about their ethic because they have an ethic. They have a way of understanding what is right and what is wrong. It's their moral code that they've built somehow, right? And prophets address our false moral codes. That's what prophets do in speaking with authority. 
The last thing that prophets address is that they address our selfishness. The, way, the reason that we need truth reoriented for us or reframed is that we are very selfish people and we want to own what is true, right? We live in a culture where we say it's my truth, right? We own truth all of a sudden. And so reframing truth as a, in a, the prophetic voice is to say, no, I'm going to take that back and tell you that the only one who owns truth is Jesus. The only one who can speak authoritatively is Jesus. The only one who understands what God's heart is, is Jesus. You can flip the slide. So if we're going to be prophets in the manga style of Jesus, um, then we have to be people who learn together and as individuals to reveal God's heart. How do we do that? How do we speak with authority and how do we reframe truth? So I just want to look at a couple places to kind of ponder this with you. So the first one I want to look at is how Jesus reveals, as a prophet, I think, the heart of God. So in John chapter 8, we have a really famous story where a woman caught in adultery is dragged in front of Jesus. At, the dawn, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said, To Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, there's a lot going on in the story, but when, it, when we're just thinking about how, does the, how is the heart of God revealed through Jesus in a prophetic way? Well, number one, it's really interesting that he does not begin to do what a priest might do or a king might do, which is to discuss the law and how it works and what the structures are and how we can get things to be fair. No, he does what a prophet does. He begins with the sin. He says the first one who has no splintered part of them. The one that has perfect intimacy with God, you throw the rock. Like you're the one who really loves God and has their whole soul and adoration towards God, you can pick up the rock and throw it at her. He addresses sin, the brokenness of the people. And you notice that the older ones who are around, have been around for a while, left first. Like they get it and then they all kind of went away. Now he could have looked at her and just said, we made it through that. I'm so happy, man. Let's get out of here. Like that was, that was a close one. (laughs) Instead, he looks at her and he says, where did everybody go? Like, where did they go? And she's like, well, there's nobody here. So he's like, well, I'm not going to condemn you. But I like what he says, what does he do? He addresses her splintering. He's like, you need to stop chasing after other things to fill you up. You need to stop your what? He didn't say stop this particular sin. It was stop this life of sin. Like, you need to readdress. You need to repent. You need to turn around, right? He gives her a very prophetic thing. But in all of it, there's compassion, Right? A lot of times we think about, if you go to the Old Testament prophets, that they're, they're mean and they're pointing their finger. But no, most of the time they're saying, no, no, God, he loves you and he wants you and he wants you to come back. There's this gentleness in addressing the splintering, right? You and I have some judgments. When I read that story, I immediately judge the Pharisees, right? I'm mad at them. Instantly, I have judgments for them. I'm curious, I have a judgment for Jesus because why didn't he tell me what's written in the sand? Like, I have a lot of opinions and judgments already. And then I'm starting to think, like, well, what is going on with her? Like, we have judgments about why people do what they do. And then that impacts the way we relate to them. 
The invitation to be a prophet is to grab hold of the heart of God, which is you learning to unsplinter yourself at some level and be able to offer people a little bit of the intimacy of God so that you can address their splintering, right? So a lot of it is being willing to repent that you are judgmental, that every situation you step into, you are a judge that you should not be, right? That, that is the beginning of following Jesus because Jesus is the only judge. Now, speak with authority. Jesus is hanging out. He's teaching. Matthew 7, 28, 29 says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. So the teachers of the law would spend a lot of time saying, this is what so-and-so thinks, this is what so-and-so thinks. They're more of a commentary-oriented thing. It would be kind of like if one of you got up here and said, okay, let's talk about prophets. Now, Eric says... And Eric says this, and, and I heard that Eric read this and that he said this about this particular passage we've just read. No, speaking with authority, why it was so different is that Jesus was speaking as if he'd written the text himself, right? So he was saying, like, I, so he spoke so he could say, this is what it means, this is what God is saying. Well, here's this really interesting thing. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, have the Spirit of God. And John tells us in one of his letters in First John that you don't need me to speak with authority. It's not hard for you to say, you know, that Scripture says, offer your body as a living sacrifice in Romans chapter 12. This is what it looks like to offer your body. It's not hard for you to say that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. This is what it means to not lean on your own understanding. You can be speak those things. But the place that you get that authority is out of God's scripture and out of God's spirit. But what this tends um, to address in us is our own moralizing. You see, if we're having problems with one another in the community or we're fighting with people, then we have these rules about like, well, they did the wrong thing. They're acting this way. But then you go pick up scripture and scripture says, do everything in your power to live at peace. You're like, oh, well, I don't like that rule. Um, I have my own understanding about what, how we treat people, right? Well, these two are kind of linked in the sense of the third thing that a prophet does is tends to reframe things. And let me just give you an example of how Jesus does this in the Sermon on the Mount, and he does it with authority, and you and I can do this. Matthew 5, 43 says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise and the evil, on the evil and the good, and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, it's a good rule. Love your neighbor. That's nice. Makes sense that when you have an enemy, you should hate them, right? Because they're doing mean things to you. And that seems like a logical thing you should do. Hate your enemy, Right? Jesus says, no, no, here's, here's the crazy thing. You should love your neighbor and your enemy, and when your enemy's persecuting you, you should pray for them. Which is a completely, like, that is not the truth of our world, right? That's not the way we work. It's, it's reframing it. Prophets reframe truth. What happens is it, it addresses our selfishness. Right? Because for me to love my enemy means it's going to be more difficult for me. I'm going to be in uncomfortable places. They're going to say mean things to me. They might do violent things to me. They may do a whole bunch of stuff that I don't like that is going to make my life miserable. And I'm committed to not having a miserable life. That's my goal. Right? That's all of your goals. Like, if really, if you thought about it, like, you don't want to be an NBA player. You just don't want to have a miserable life. Right? That, that like... <laughs> That's, you would much prefer that because we're all afraid of a miserable life and the way you get one is to have an enemy or multiple enemies who you have to love and pray for. Right? That, that is, that is the, the reframing that a prophet offers us. So when we talk about Jesus holding the office of prophet, dumb watch, 
when we talk about Jesus holding the office of prophet, there are two things that happen. One, he's speaking at us. Like just the very fact that we say, okay, Jesus was a prophet, we understand that one of his modes is that he's addressing our splintering. Like he's addressing our brokenness and calling us into an intimacy with God. Like that there's, that, there's an invitation. But as his disciples, he's asking us to do something. So this is what I want to invite you into this week. I think God is going to give you some times and moments in individuals' lives, in this community and outside, where he's going to say, this is the moment I want you to address the sin here. I want you to speak. I want you to reorient truth. He's going to invite you to do some things that are going to be really scary. But I promise he'll probably not ask you to do anything Old Testament. So none of you need to get naked. There won't be any cooking over, you know, the dung. Like, you probably won't have to do any of those things. It will just be an awkward moment where you are persecuted a little bit and God is asking you to speak or to love your enemy or to address the splintering. Because here's the thing. Think about what God is doing in this particular program. Because the reason that we're going over to this prophet, priest, and king is that we, when you and I act in these as we follow Jesus, the kingdom of God begins to vibrate and act. And you and I get to participate in a program that, that has this beautiful end and we're acting in it. And when you and I are prophets and act as prophets as a church and as individuals, we're inviting people into little moments of walking in the cool of the night with God. That's why we want to be prophets, not because we want to, to do something dramatic or get people to repent of their sin because they're all evil. No, we want people to get back to that, that moment when heaven and earth come together, where God of the universe walks with humans, where there's a moment of adoration, standing face to face, mouth to mouth. There's an intimacy back and forth with the God of the universe. Right? That's why we want to be a prophet. That's why we should get excited. I have one minute for questions. I probably have more because we started late as normal. Oh, yeah. the mic man. There you go. Um, I agree. Or, or I should say, the stuff you're talking about, where, where we're invited to walk in Jesus' steps as a prophet feels true. Um, I want to come back to what you were talking about with the with that quote because... Um, it, it seems like you can't say that for every attribute of God because, well, Jesus is king, so his church and followers should also be king. I don't, so I guess it's difficult to discern sure. when, which ones to follow. Well, I would say, yes, if Jesus was king, you also are king uh, in the sense that in the kingdom of God is upside down. And so the the greatest of the kingdom will serve. So, yeah. And the greatest of the kingdom served by dying on the cross for our sins. Uh, what do you do with your own? Um, I, like, I'm never 100% sure that what I'm saying is right. And so I'm afraid to speak with authority. Right. So you're afraid to say, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well, that's good. You could even say it seems good to me, um, and to the Holy Spirit. That's what <laughs> that's that's what what the uh, the early apostles said. No, I think a lot of times we are afraid of damage we might do. So that's why it's important to understand that a prophet is in touch with the heart of God. Like the first part of the prophet is to understand the love that he has for his people. So if you can't speak those words, even if they might be wrong, if you can speak them out of love, the Holy Spirit will use them. If you don't speak them out of love, then yeah, you probably shouldn't say them at all. It would be kind of... So being wrong is not the important thing. Having a heart that's engaged with God's heart is more of the important thing. So uh, as far as like 
when to speak up and when to, you know, stay quiet. One piece of really good advice that I can't take credit for because I received it from Emily McConnell <laughs> is that, um, you know, if if you're feeling like there's something you should say and you're but you're not sure if it's right, just go ahead and say it and trust God to work out the rest of it and not like take so much responsibility for oh is this the right thing or is it not like God will use it regardless sure very good anyone else any other thoughts on being a prophet of church having a prophetic voice questions answers all right let's pray Father, thank you uh, for this community. Thank you uh, for the food that's coming. Thank you for the opportunity to sing and worship you and uh, to step into your footsteps as a prophet. Help us to do that humbly and with um, courage. And Lord, I, I just ask that today would be, uh, that today's talk would be one that would um, encourage people to begin to pick up the scriptures and read them and find, uh, to dig deeper into what it means that you were um, the prophet of God and that you were God. I ask that all in your name. Amen.